Welcome back from that break. Let's look at news in business. In business today, Uganda has registered a decline in the monetary value of exports from 333 million US dollars, which is 1.3 trillion and in May, to 302 million US dollars, about 1.1 trillion shillings in the month of June. According to the latest performance of the economy report from the finance ministry, the decline is attributed to a reduction in export volumes of fish products, coffee, tea, electricity, simsim, and hides and skins. Paul Busharizi joins us to explain further what this means for the economy and what needs to be done. Oh well, so Uganda's export earnings have reduced. First of all, what is that? What are the export earnings? I think uh, the, the, it's a report from the Ministry of Finance, mm -hmm. and they're reporting on the month of uh, June. Mm -hmm. And I think they've uh, said, I think they've gone down from 333, I don't know, from 381 million dollars, I think, yeah, to, to 333. 302. 302, yes. yes. Three mi uh, 302 million dollars, mm -hmm. yeah, during that period, compared to the, the, the period, the, the, Ju the June 2018. Yes. Yes. I'm still wondering, what are these export earnings? Is it the money we get from export? The, the money, this w in this specific case, it's the money we get from uh, trading goods. So we also have services, but these are not included in this uh, mm. in this thing. So it's goods, and I think the find the finding is, I mean, it's n it's not a secret that uh, our biggest export earners are coffee, fish, and uh, gold. Interestingly, oh, yeah. and gold is actually oh. the biggest of all those three. Oh, and actually, in that month, uh, the exports of coffee and fish went down t m slightly, mm -hmm. but the ones of gold rose. So gold uh, is um, this, this, yeah. that's really interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, so development. All oh, right. Uh, so it's the biggest export earner. Even last year, mm -hmm. I think t uh, 2018 or was it 2018, 19, mm -hmm. gold brought in the, the single biggest export of goods earner. And I like that we are calm and uh, quiet about this. Well, what to say? It's just um, a fact. You know, coffee, we still, co we still export raw coffee. So how bright is your future when you don't even determine your own prices? You still export raw fish. Maybe in gold is where you can say maybe the future is bright because we are now beginning to... Uh, to uh, I think in that sector it's safe to say that you can now negotiate your price. Right. Yeah, it's refined gold. So. Um, well, what just keep going. Done? Steady progress. What can be done? Well, um, we need to, of course, uh, we need to improve. We need to produce more produce of everything more. else we do. Yes, and also... Uh, we need to produce more. We need to improve our infrastructure so that we can move it around much quicker within Uganda. We need to make our linkages to the markets abroad. Mm -hmm. and, and most definitely, we need to be uh, pushing for industry to, to get some processing going. That's right, mm. that's right. It's harder to break into those markets when your goods are processed than when they are raw. Yeah. But uh, we've got to start somewhere. Well, at least that's something very good. Uh, even if it is bad, but somehow we are doing something good and we'll get there. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> You're welcome. That was News in Business. Now for a Pearl of Africa series today, we look at the African rock python. The African rock python is the third biggest snake in the world. They have the capacity to kill and swallow a prey that is twice their size. A snake of this nature is kept at the Uganda Wildlife Education Center. Let's take a look. This snake coiling in the grass is known as an African rock python. These are identified from the pattern on their bodies which are thick and covered with colored brooches and irregular stripes. These body markings vary from brown, olive, chestnut and yellow but fade to white on the underside. The head of an African rock python is triangular and is marked on the top with a dark brown spearhead outlined in bathy yellow. As the trend is at the Uganda Wildlife Education Center, all the animals kept here have names. Dan Mirembe Zookeeper tells us how they gave this python a name. Give them names depending on the pattern that they have on their skin. So for this snake here, 
if you can come very close, uh, you will see this one is like letter N, okay? This one is like letter N, and these are three eyes, and this one is N, and then the other one is what? Uh, so this one we can call it Nini. So we have Kamuli, we have Kui, so depending on the pattern that they have. Yuek has just six necks of this kind, but normally such creatures are not rescued from predators but appear suddenly. Such snakes are known to be the biggest in Africa, but they are ranked at number three in the world as they can swallow a human being thrice their size. Mirembe adds that even when they are attacked after feeding, they can vomit the prey and respond to the attack. This makes me ask, what do they feed these animals with? So we feed them on chicken and uh, the response is always depending on the what? On the appetite. So if one has good appetite, it can eat even all the 30 chicken. So on every week, we normally give them around 30 chicken. So we put them inside there and each one will keep on picking one by one. A male python is differentiated from a female by physically looking at the size and the tail. The female African rock python is bigger than the male, and also the tail of the female are pointed than that of the male. I can't say snakes are friendly animals, but according to Mirembe, a snake gives you a warning before it attacks. This can explain why he can freely hold it on his shoulder and freely interact with me as he lightly holds its head. That is it for today. More adventure series coming up tomorrow in our bulletin. For more Pearl of Africa stories, visit our website www.newvision.co.ug forward slash Pearl of Africa. You can also grab yourself a copy of the Sunday Vision that carries more of these adventure stories. For our special report today, the last 50 years have seen a transformation in the energy sector from one dam, Owen Falls Dam, which produced 60 megawatts in 1954 to many dams that are producing over 1,000 megawatts. The country's energy needs have also changed. In the rural areas where people depended on Tadoba, which are small paraffin lamps for light, we look at how rural electrification has changed this. As the Karuma Hydropower Project nears completion, Uganda's power generation capacity is already outstripping demand, meaning the days of load shedding are buried in the past. In March this year, Isimba Hydropower Dam was commissioned, boosting Uganda's total installed electricity generation capacity to 1,167 megawatts, up from 984 megawatts. Located between the Kayunga and Kamuli districts, the dam was the most recent power project commissioned in the country. It became the third dam constructed since 1986 and is a significant landmark. The other two, Akira and Bujagali dams, commissioned in 2003 and 2012, respectively. The $567.7 million Isimba Dam adds 183 megawatts to the national grid. This development means Uganda's electricity supply outstrips demand, which is at 600 megawatts at peak hours by far. Completion of such a project is an indicator of transformation. Not all is static or degenerating as some politicians would like to project Uganda. Looking back in history, the country is far better than it was in the 1970s and 1980s. In those days, Uganda had only one power generation station at the Owen Falls Dam, renamed Nalubali. The power dam was constructed in 1954 with a 50-year lifespan. Due to economic and political upheavals, coupled with inability to maintain it, Nalubali's generation capacity slipped. 
from 180 megawatts, it steadily dropped to 60 megawatts. There were even no plans to construct dams to generate power for industrialization, a point overlooked by many. As power supply dropped, Ugandans resigned to the reality and sloshed into the belief that it was no more. There was no point in complaining, so they remained quiet. Besides, at the time, complaints or protests would be construed as subversive activities that would send one to prison without trial. Today, reactions to any slightest interruption in the electricity supply are loud and abusive. In some places, people block roads demanding immediate restoration of supply. Whereas access to electricity is demanded like a right, it was not a case in the past. Because then, there was limited access to information. Few people traveled out of the country, and it was not possible to compare with other countries. Ugandans yielded to no electricity regime. Insufficient supply forced many to resort to paraffin or kerosene candles, locally called tadoba, made out of tins for lightning, round-shaped with a wick running through a baby finger size shoot pipe from its belly filled with paraffin. It would light and smoke at the same time. It was a lucrative business for metal fabricators who cut pieces of tins to make them. They even had market in urban centers, including Kampala. Today, a sign of transformation to use a tadoba has decreased consequently. Demand for paraffin has dropped. In Kampala, only a few fuel stations deal in paraffin. Previously, shops would stock it and sell in little scoops, known anymore. Instead, they have bulbs whose demand is high as the number of homes connected to the national electricity grid grows. Today, in case of power outage, people would rather use wax candles or at best solar lamps but not paraffin candles. However, there are still some parts of Uganda where the Tadoba is still burning but there is hope soon the rural electrification project will effect change. In those dark days, it was normal for urban centers to go without electricity for days, just like water taps were eternally dry. With low and unreliable electricity supply, industrialization was constricted as a result. There were no jobs. People then had only government to look to for employment. In 1986, when President Yoram Seven took power, Electricity generation was at 60 megawatts and would not ably power the new government's industrialization dream. This was also an indictment of the previous governments for lack of foresight to develop the power sectors. But the fact is instability, lack of financial resources and poor planning conspired to keep such critical sectors underdeveloped or not prioritized. Take, for instance, during the 1970s, Idi Amin's government paid no attention to power generation capacity. This was aggravated by experts who would have advised fleeing the country from the brutal regime. The situation persisted even after the fall of Amin in 1979. The new leaders in the post-Amini era were busy fighting for political positions as the state of key resources and sectors deteriorated further. At the peak of load shedding, in the 2000s, critics blamed government for the insufficient power without considering the failure of developing new power generation stations since 1962 when Uganda got its independence. New criticisms emerging now is not on lack of sufficient power, but over supply. The critics of the load shedding days have turned around. They are now criticizing government for poor planning, saying Isimba and soon to be commissioned Karuma with installed generation capacity of 600 megawatts are white elephants. This is missing the point. Sufficient power is what attracts investors to set up factories. 
they will not invest in a country without guarantees of steady supply and sufficient power. That was New Vision TV News. Thank you for watching. We'll catch you next time. I'll leave you with a fact file.